Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey. Welcome back. Today we're discussing Chapter 7, adapted from David Emery Shy's America, A Narrative History. And this concerns the first few decades of the 19th century, a period that we call the Early Republic. Okay? And this is a, a really big transitional period for the United States because this is the first full century that the U.S. has existed as a nation. Okay? We've only been in existence by this point for about 20, 30 years, give or take. And so we're kind of going through uh, a lot of changes over the course of this, um, this period of time that are going to end up uh, impacting the United States for the better part of a century or more to come. Okay? And many of these uh, different changes are what ultimately leads us into um, you know, sectional rifts, uh, in, including you know, states' rights versus the national government, and ultimately the Civil War. So the first thing, of course, we can talk about here is the election of Thomas Jefferson to the presidency. Okay? Um, this is the first time that we have had a president who has had a, a peaceful transition into power. Okay? Um, remember, George Washington actually didn't become president until roughly six years after the United States uh, came into existence. Okay? And John Adams, immediately thereafter, um, kind of got into uh, some immediate rifts with his own people, with uh, Federalists versus Republicans and everything. And so now that Thomas Jefferson comes into the presidency, this is the first time that things seem to be rather smooth. And he's also the first president who's inaugurated in Washington, D.C. Remember, this is uh, the, you know, the nation's capital has only really existed in Washington, D.C. for a few years by now, right? maybe only about a decade. Uh, of course, Washington was inaugurated in New York, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe John Adams was inaugurated in Philadelphia. Um, and the thing about Thomas Jefferson and the Republican Party at this point is that when we talk about the Republicans, we're talking about a completely different form of the Republican Party than what exists today. Okay? The actual modern version of the Republican Party really didn't come into full fruition until probably about the 1980s. Okay? So um, the party has gone through some significant changes, uh, even though this initial form of it does share a few similarities with, uh, with modern day Republicanism. Uh, and Jefferson touts what he refers to here as Republican simplicity. Okay? He doesn't really put on a, a big show when he's inaugurated. He doesn't have any parades or anything like that. And he starts kind of uh, stylizing himself or people stylize him you know, objectively as the people's president for that reason. Okay? He, he tries to kind of become a, a man of the people, so to speak. Um, and Jefferson himself, for all of his actual faults, he is uh, an individual that we would refer to as a polymath. And what I mean by that is he is an individual who is an expert in several different areas that don't really seem to be fully connected. Okay? He can basically uh, become a master at whatever he sets his mind to. Okay? He's a, a genius in many regards. Okay? He's a lawyer, a politician, a philosopher, an architect, a designer. Um, but of course, the underpinning all this is the fact that uh, Jefferson's presidency seems to be one that's tainted with a lot of hypocrisy. Okay? He has uh, a lot of what we've already referred to as cognitive dissonance in, in regards to his ethics. Okay? Um, the, the biggest stain, of course, in all this is slavery. The fact that he continues to uh, condemn slavery as an institution. He's actually the, the uh, first president that we have who outlaws the importation of slaves into the United States and yet he still continues to own slaves for the remainder of his life. I okay, remember even going so far as to impregnate a 14-year-old girl uh, when he was in his 40s and ending up having you know, between six and eight children with her. Um, so in other words, he, you know, he continues to condemn it while at the same time supporting it. Okay? And like many Southerners at the time, he became so overly dependent on slave labor that he really probably did not know how to function otherwise. And the fact that he continues to decry the fact that the country is, you know, it, you know, washed with debt at this point. Okay, uh, Alexander Hamilton's efforts have been, you know, relatively successful, and we've got a pretty decent credit rating as a country right now. Um, but uh, he he continues to rack up debt while at the same time saying that we don't need to rack up debt. Okay, and even though he continues to say that, you know, we need to have a a simplistic ruler of the country. We don't need anyone who is going to spend a whole lot of money on these, uh, you know, lavish, you know, extravagant lifestyles. He continues to indulge himself in that as well. Okay. Um, one fun little fact about him that I like to throw out there is the fact that he is responsible for popularizing both ice cream and macaroni and cheese in the United States. Okay? 
Um, in fact, if you go out onto the Library of Congress website, you can actually dig a little bit and you will find a handwritten recipe by him for macaroni and cheese. So if you're ever interested in that, I recommend you go take a look. Uh, in terms of the rest of Jefferson's cabinet, okay, we have his vice president, Aaron Burr, okay, and Burr plays a, a major role uh, in U.S. politics, as we'll see here in a little while, and is a very strange figure. Uh, we have James Madison, the Secretary of State. Okay, Madison, remember, is responsible for authoring a major portion of the U.S. Constitution and eventually becomes president himself. And as far as the Secretary of the Treasury goes, we have an individual named Albert Gallatin, okay? And he's a, a Republican congressman from Pennsylvania who seems relatively unremarkable, except for the fact that he is the first politician that we really have in record in the United States who tries to grant government positions to women, okay? Um, most of the uh, other individuals uh, you know, shoot down this proposition, including Jefferson, okay? So despite Gallatin's efforts, women don't actually enter politics into much, much later into U.S. history. Now, the first major Supreme Court case that actually occurs uh, during this time period is one that sets a big precedent for many more to come, uh, and it's uh, when Congress decides to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801, leads to the court case called Marbury versus Madison. And this harkens back to the period of when John Adams was president, because remember, his last act as president was to try to shrink the Supreme Court down from six members to five, okay? Uh, and in order to do so, he wanted to actually uh, leave a position open with uh, a certain individual in mind here, okay? And this was actually uh, a bigger part, not for the Supreme Court. This actually has to do with justice of the peace, okay? Uh, he'd written an appointment letter for a man named William Marbury uh, to become justice of the peace in Washington, D.C., but the letter never got delivered while Adams was in office, okay? So by a strange loophole, uh, the letter actually arrives much, much later um, but uh, Jefferson actually sees this as uh, an opportunity to kind of shoot down what John Adams did before, because remember, they're from two different political parties. Okay? And so he orders James Madison to withhold the appointment, and William Marbury tries to sue the president and the government for, um, for neglect here, for basically saying, you know, you're, you're trying to deny me a position that your predecessor was trying to give. And so we have Chief Justice John Marshall presiding over the case here. And he ends up ruling in favor of Marbury initially before he looks at this and says that the Federal Judiciary Act was an unconstitutional effort. Okay? He says that uh, the Supreme Court in this case has the right to overrule both Congress and the president. Okay? Uh, and he also sets the precedent for saying that the Supreme Court now has the right to original jurisdiction when it comes to uh, foreign ambassadors or nations uh, being involved in legal matters. And the Supreme Court also gains the right of what we know now as judicial review, okay? And this is something that is fairly commonplace these days. Okay? Anytime a, uh, a, a civil rights case or something along those lines comes up in the, the forefront of American society, it eventually gets passed on to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has to look at certain laws that have been put in place, uh, has to look at certain constitutional amendments and decide whether or not they are actually constitutional and need to be kept. Okay, uh, this uh, eventually ends up happening uh, with with several major ones, uh, especially uh, ones like um, uh, the 18th Amendment, which has to do with prohibition. Uh, of course, like I said, we see several in instances like this with regard to civil rights as well. Um, and with regard to Jefferson's relationship with debt, we've already just briefly mentioned this. Um, he doesn't like the way that Alexander Hamilton has held uh, the office of Secretary of Treasury okay, before Gallatin comes into office. He doesn't like all the financial proposals that Hamilton has tried to continue to um, you know, be a proponent of. Okay? And main reason for this is Jefferson says that this is too close to what England has done. Remember, Jefferson is more in favor of the French model of doing things than he is the, the English model. Okay? So this is kind of his own personal prejudice coming to the forefront a little bit here. Um, he ends up slashing the budget quite a bit, fires a lot of tax collectors, and ends up cutting military funding in half, okay? And this is something that actually comes back to bite him, uh, you know, a, a little bit further on, the closer we get to the War of 1812, okay? And his successor, James Madison, actually ends up suffering quite a bit uh, in the aftermath of this even occurring, 
Um, Jefferson also repeals the whiskey tax of 1791. Remember, this is what caused George Washington to actually lead a force into Pennsylvania to try to, uh, you know, prevent an open rebellion from occurring. And Ohio gets admitted as a state in 1803. Okay, we've now rounded things out to adding uh, four extra states since the beginning of uh, the nation. Okay, so we've gone from 13 states to 17. Another strange little side story that occurs in the midst of all this is something that really never gets covered all that often in the, the grand narrative of U.S. history, and it's a bizarre episode that occurs between the United States and what is known as the Barbary Coast on the uh, northern coast of Africa. Okay. Um, 1807, as, as I said before, this is when uh, Jefferson decides to openly ban the importation of all African slaves into the United States. Okay. And even though this is something that he does uh, openly, right? He does this and makes it a law that no uh, individuals can be you know, imported in this way. Um, it doesn't stop slave traders from continuing the practice. Okay, slavery still continues well past 1807. Of course, we know that it's officially, you know, banned in 1865 after the Civil War ends. But uh, this is supposed to uh, put a basically say that the U.S. government is not going to openly endorse this any further. Uh, and so this kind of begins the, uh, the eventual rift that ends up occurring between the North and the South, states' rights, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis slavery versus federal government and ultimately abolition. Okay. Um, but of course, from this point going all the way to the beginning of the Civil War, we have over 300,000 slaves who are smuggled into the country. Okay, So again, just because Jefferson bans the slave trade doesn't mean that it goes away entirely. Okay, Quite the opposite, in fact. Getting back to this uh, episode with the Barbary Coast, um, we suddenly have uh, several instances where North African pirates began to actually uh, capture American crews and ships that are leaving the Barbary Coast with slaves and coming back to the United States. Okay, so this is kind of related in a, in a small way here. In 1801, uh, the nation of Tripoli starts to increase its demands uh, for ransom. Okay, so anytime Tripoli has uh, taken control of a ship or has, uh, you know, impressed its crew into service or has taken them hostage or something like that, it starts to level ransom payments to the United States government and ends up fully on declaring war on us. And so we enter into a, a little four-year period where we're kind of in this quasi-war with the Barbary Coast. Okay? Um, and it ultimately comes to a little bit of a head here when um, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur goes into Tripoli and burns the frigate Philadelphia. Okay? Uh, and the ruler of Tripoli finally agrees to uh, a $60,000 ransom, which of course is a ton of money back in those days, uh, for the release of the crew of the Philadelphia. Okay? And so this is the only way that we're able to actually skirt a uh, full-fledged war with the Barbary Coast. Again, kind of a strange episode and one that never really gets brought up all that often because it really doesn't have a whole lot of long-term effects, okay? but still something worth mentioning because of its relationship to the slave trade. So potentially the biggest feather in Jefferson's cap throughout his first term in office especially is the Louisiana Purchase. Okay? And the background to this is, of course, we've got this period immediately after the French Revolution where Napoleon has stepped in. Okay? Napoleon Bonaparte ends up taking over the uh, essentially the power vacuum that exists in France, and he expands the French Empire into uh, something that ends up conquering most of mainland Europe, uh, almost to the same extent that Nazi Germany takes over in the 1940s. And by 1801, Napoleonic France is now taking control of Spanish-controlled Louisiana as well. Okay, so this uh, territory that is the Louisiana Territory begins under the French, gets passed to the Spanish, and then now back to the French again. Okay. Um, Robert Livingston, who is the U.S. ambassador to France at this point, is actually sent to Napoleon uh, in London to try to treat with him to basically avoid war at all costs because, of course, Napoleon loves to conquer new territory. And so the concern here is that he is going to suddenly send troops over into the Louisiana Territory and try to take control of the United States. And the whole goal of Livingston uh, going there, of course, not only to avoid war, but to see if we can possibly purchase New Orleans and Western Florida from France. Okay? Because if we can do this, these are two very strategic uh, 
uh, reason or regions. Okay, remember New Orleans is a very um, important port at this point because it actually links Canada to the Gulf Coast via the Mississippi River. Okay, so it's a major shipping highway. Uh, and of course, Western Florida at this point is still uh, a region that is, you know, on the border of the United States, and uh, you know, again, is you know, butts up to the Gulf Coast and so forth. So that, again, has to do with shipping, uh, and of course, uh, Native American attacks are coming from there as well. Okay, so it's another uh, way that the U.S. can be a little bit more strategically positioned. Uh, Jefferson also sends James Monroe to assist, and Monroe also becomes president eventually here. And Napoleon actually comes out of the blue and offers to sell the United States the entirety of the Louisiana Territory, which is something that uh, Livingston and Monroe had no real uh, inkling that he would do. Okay, They're looking for a very small percentage of this, and he offers them all of it. Um, meanwhile, we also end up with a slave revolt on the island of French Saint-Domingue. Okay, We have a, an individual named Toussaint Louverture here. He's a free Jacobin. Okay? Remember, the Jacobins were... Uh, the individuals under um, uh, Robespierre who rose up against the French monarchy and overthrew it during the French Revolution. So there's still a presence of them here in the Caribbean. Um, and the French army, even though it tries to intervene, is now fighting in a subtropical climate. Okay, And they end up encountering malaria. And uh, again, just the, the simple brutality of the warfare in general ends up absolutely decimating the French army. Okay. And so L'Overture actually ends up becoming victorious here and proclaims the Republic of Haiti. In 1803. So this is where we get the nation of Haiti. Um, the Treaty of Session the same year is kind of the official document that ends up occurring between Napoleon and the United States. Okay, We end up paying 15 million dollars for 875,000 square miles of land. Okay? And this is um, initially viewed as uh, something of a refuse dump, unfortunately. Okay? It's not really looked at uh, very favorably as a place where we can um, so initially, this is not really a territory that the United States looks at as a place for settlers to actually go, but as a place where they can potentially relocate Native American tribes uh, and even slaves that have been freed. Okay, So basically, individuals who don't really have any citizenship rights at this point in time, they believe that they could somehow just continue to push them westward, and eventually they'll end up settling somewhere or get moved out of the way once again, which is, of course, what does end up happening. Um, and, of course, this is also considered to be a, a buffer against foreign invasion as well, because if we have this entire expanse of the western portion of the United States that is now uh, completely unoccupied by people, right, it's nothing more than open wilderness. And, of course, the Federalists don't like this idea because, remember, the Federalists and the Republicans have two completely different ideas of what they want to be done with this territory. Okay? Um, the Federalists don't like the idea of taking control of this entire territory because we have a Republican president in office. Okay? And Jefferson is looking eventually at settling this region uh, with everyday people. Okay? And the Federalists uh, think that uh, if Republicans end up settling the territory, then somehow the executive branch is going to get too big for itself. It's going to become too powerful uh, and will end up squashing their interests. Okay? And ironically, the Federalists are the ones who are looking for that to happen in the opposite direction. The other really popular instance that occurs after the Louisiana Purchase is the journey of Lewis and Clark. Uh, in 1804, Jefferson asks that Congress uh, fund a scientific expedition into the Louisiana Territory and try to reach the Pacific Ocean if possible. Okay? And so he sends his private secretary, Meriwether Lewis, and a frontiersman named William Clark. And the two of them end up uh, leaving uh, from St. Louis. Okay? St. Louis is known at this point, and even today, as the gateway to the west. It's kind of the midway point between the eastern coast and the west coast. And they move northwest into the North Dakota Territory and eventually make their way over into the Oregon Territory. Okay. And the way they do this is they send soil and wildlife samples down the Missouri River to St. Louis okay, on these little barges. So uh, animal specimens, plant specimens, just about anything that they can find. And of course, unfortunately, when it comes to the animals especially, quite often they hunt these animals and uh, end up sending you know, carcasses and you know, remains and so forth as well.
1805, they actually encounter a French fur trader and his uh, pregnant Shoshone wife named Sacagawea. Uh, they end up joining the party here after uh, Lewis and Clark end up delivering Sacagawea's baby. Okay? Uh, she's uh, apparently overcome with gratitude, at least that's the, the general narrative anyway, and decides to repay them by being a guide, a translator, and even a negotiator when it comes to encountering native tribes. Okay, So she has know, enough clout, I guess, with the other native tribes where she's able to do this. And ultimately, the party does reach the Pacific Ocean uh, through the Snake and Columbia Rivers, and they construct uh, Fort Clatsop, which is in modern-day Oregon. And when they finally return in 1806, they've gone 8,000 miles and they've cataloged 180 plants and 125 different animal specimens. Okay, so this has become uh, essentially a rousing success, okay? And their exploits are actually updated in Eastern newspapers, okay? So anytime a new uh, sample comes into um, St. Louis and eventually gets passed on to the U.S. government, right, it gets updated and people start to follow their exploits kind of in like a, um, a serial type thing. And after that, the U.S. ends up claiming the Oregon country by right of discovery and exploration. Okay, so this ends up leading us into a little bit of a conflict with some other foreign nations who are also trying to do the same thing, okay, specifically Great Britain and even Russia, which at this point tries to take control of the region as well. After Lewis and Clark return, of course, Jefferson's support uh, ends up skyrocketing, uh, especially in the South and in the West, where all of his Republican constituents are. Um, people think that he actually is more interested in progress, that he uh, is not really the, you know, the backward-looking agriculturalist that people initially characterized him to be. Okay. Um, the major debacle that occurs when uh, Jefferson is re-elected president, or when he is actually on, on the verge of being re-elected, is his vice president, Aaron Burr, goes rogue. Okay. He tries to link New York politically to New England by running for the governor of New York as an independent candidate. Okay. Um, and at this point in time, New York is a part of the middle colonies. Okay. It's kind of a mixed um, region where there's you know, kind of half Federalist, half Republican. And New England at this point is pretty staunchly um, Federalist, okay. the opposite party of uh, what Jefferson has in mind. Okay, so Burr seems like he's trying to do Jefferson a favor, but Jefferson apparently has not asked him to do this at all. Um, and Alexander Hamilton intervenes at this point and urges the Federalists not to vote for Burr because he says it's a dangerous man, he's a lunatic, don't do it. And this is when Burr very infamously challenges Hamilton to a duel over losing the election, and Hamilton loses. He's actually shot and killed. Okay. Um, and afterwards, of course, Aaron Burr ends up becoming a fugitive of justice. He actually escapes over state lines into South Carolina uh, to, you know, escape being charged for murder. Uh, immediately afterward, Jefferson is renominated, and now he has George Clinton as his vice president. Okay? He doesn't rely on Aaron Burr anymore because Burr has gone crazy and, of course, has escaped justice. Um, 1803, we also get the ratification of the 12th Amendment. This basically just says the Electoral College has to use separate ballots to vote for the president and vice president. In other words, they can't be both included on the same ticket just to grant a little bit more freedom of choice here. Uh, and on the Federalist ticket, we have Charles Pinckney, who, um, you know, a few decades before ended up getting into uh, a treaty with uh, Spain, kind of a controversial thing where we end up gaining control of part of uh, Florida for a little while, or at least this is where we get the border of the United States with Spanish Florida. And he runs with a, a man named Rufus King on the Federalist ticket. Of course, Pinckney and King end up losing. Okay. Uh, and Jefferson and Clinton have such a major landslide victory here that they actually win every single state except for Delaware and Connecticut. Now, once Jefferson is reelected, uh, the Republican Party ends up fracturing. And anytime a political party ends up fracturing, it usually spells defeat for that particular party over time. Okay, this is one rare instance where that actually does not occur. Okay, we end up having um, Republicans in the, the White House for probably about the next 15 to 20 years, even after Jefferson leaves. Uh, but we have two different branches of the Republican Party here. We have the Jeffersonian or Nationalist Republicans. Okay. Uh, and these are ones who start to embody more of what Jefferson has evolved into over time, okay? Willing to compromise the idea of states' rights to maintain 
uh, you know, some sense of nationalism and national tariffs, right, to try to you know, keep control of the federal government as a whole, to preserve the national bank, right, to try to basically say we need to have some kind of financial institution to, um, you know, maintain control over uh, the economy, to make sure that people aren't, you know, charging, you know, crazy high interest rates and so forth. And they also want to stretch the Constitution to try to accommodate the Louisiana Purchase, because again, this is a major um, acquisition for the United States, okay? And there is no precedent in the Constitution to say whether this is lawful or not. And on the other side, you have anti-Jeffersonian or old Republicans, okay? And this is the branch that ends up uh, kind of becoming outmoded over time, okay? They're led by a, a planter from Virginia named John Randolph. Uh, and they are, you know, very staunchly, you know, committed to the idea of preserving states' rights. And this is what ultimately causes uh, Anthony Jeffersonians to eventually evolve into what becomes the Democratic Party in its first um, uh, iteration. Okay? Uh, the Democrats and the Republicans today are vastly different night and day from what they were back then. Uh, and the anti Jeffersonian Republicans also hate the idea of a strong government, right? They're more interested in the common people having a say uh, and the government not really lording itself over everyone else. So we're kind of starting to see a little bit of the writing on the wall here, and especially when it comes to sectionalism in the country. I mean, the South starts to nurse grudges against the North, and again, within 60 years or so, we end up getting embroiled in a civil war over it. And the other thing that the um, anti-Jeffersonian Republicans are nursing here as well is the idea that they don't want to compromise with the Federalists in any way. Okay? It's not really an enemy of my enemy is my friend type situation. Um, and they also are very much pro-slavery. Okay? So again, this ends up feeding into the first real iteration of the Democratic Party, which again, changes pretty dramatically over time. Last episode we can talk about here real quickly is the fate of Aaron Burr. Okay? Um, after his duel with Hamilton and Hamilton getting killed in the process, um, he does escape into South Carolina and eventually makes his way into the Louisiana Territory to try to establish his own personal empire. Okay? So Burr seems to have kind of gone off the rails a little bit here and become uh, quite ambitious is the best way I could really put it. Um, he enlists the aid of General James Wilkinson, who uh, was actually a paid spy for Spain at this point, to try to take control of New Orleans and establish New Orleans as kind of this separate entity uh, apart from the United States. Remember, this is a very wealthy city by this point. Right? It's uh, you know, engaged in a lot of trade uh, with the Caribbean and so forth. And so somehow Burr thinks he can take over this particular region and turn it into his own personal empire. In 1806, he actually goes to New Orleans, takes 100 supporters with him, and of course, Wilkinson realizes, you know, the kind of mess that he's about to get into and ends up betraying Burr to Jefferson here. Okay. Burr is captured in 1807. He's tried for treason, but on a technicality, he actually is acquitted of all charges. Okay. He is, uh, has not actually committed an act of war because he hasn't brought any weapons with him. Okay. And so he actually ends up skipping bail to Europe and disappears. So we really, uh, uh, as far as his fate is concerned, it's no longer tied with the United States.